best school for his children. And he would go and he'd get them enrolled in this school and then after a couple of months he thought, nah, they're not as good as they, they were supposed to be. Let's go to this one. And they all packed up and went to another school. And, and so his childhood was pretty much like hopping around from school to school. Sometimes back in the United States, they had several homes in various places. Newport was one place. Uh, Chakapura, or however you say it, uh, was another place. Um, they had favorite places to go during the summer uh, that they kept going to, by the way, uh, throughout their life. James continued to go. Um, uh, his honeymoon, he took his wife, Alice, uh, to uh, the same place. By the way, they did the same kind of thing with women's names. William James married a woman named Alice. His mother's name was Alice. His sister's name was Alice. If you look, <laughs> if you look at they're, they're Alice, William, Henry. And then because you had five kids, you ended up with a Wilkie and a Bob, you know, you know, you know which was really Robertson. But, uh, you know, it's fascinating to look at them. But so they had a very European education. They had... Uh, um, fluency in French and German, as well as English. Um, and at Harvard, uh, when he started there, um, because he wanted to be a, a um, initially, he was in biology, studying biology, and primarily being taught by Louis Agassi, who is, I think, fascinating alone. if I mentioned him before or not. But he was an, a, a Swiss-born biologist who became famous teaching uh, at Harvard, uh, actually at the Lawrence Scientific uh, School or Scientific Institute. In fact, uh, a building is named in his honor at Harvard today. And the Natural History Museum was a collection that he started, uh, and it's still there, and, and a museum that you could go and visit at Harvard. Um, and his primary focus was proving Darwin to be wrong. You know, that's that's kind of amazing. Um, and an interesting aspect of the relationship he had with James was that uh, he took a team to the Amazon to study the fish in the Amazon. And it lasted for six months, and William James was one of the ones that went. He was sick initially uh, from uh, the change, um, but eventually adapted and, and did really well and really had a, a, a great experience. And they found hundreds of different kinds of fish that hadn't been cataloged and, and took those uh, back to Harvard to, to catalog and, and also uh, took specimens to Europe. To prove, and his hope was somehow that he would be able to prove that evolution doesn't happen worldwide, but instead each environment has its own species that are peculiar to it that were from the very beginning created in that space. Um, and, and of course, his studies don't seem to prove uh, his theor theory. Uh, and James didn't think so, but nonetheless, that was, that was what he was trying to do. It was a very popular, very popular lecturer. People really enjoyed him. Um, and when he died, it was a really big funeral. Lots of people came to it. Um, so science was what James was primarily interested in, especially in uh, Europe when he was over there. He visited a lot of the really big name professors there, had classes in those different places, um, including in philosophy um, and psychology. And remember, this is when psychology isn't really a science yet on its own. Um, it was very influenced by David Hume, very concerned about Kant, uh, very concerned with John Stuart Mill. So, so the ones that were, that, that whole chain of reasoning that were, he didn't have any influence uh, from Nietzsche as far as I know. But, but, I mean, he did visit Switzerland and so on. Um, so, he also knew Charles Sanders Peirce. 
and that was at um, Harvard. Charles Sanders Peirce was two years older than James. And Charles Sanders Peirce is considered to be the founder of pragmatism. So if we think about uh, the American philosophy as pragmatism, James is, or Charles Sanders Peirce is the founder, but it was William James who popularized it. And Peirce uh, was the son of Benjamin Peirce, who was the mathematics professor at Harvard. And he grew up um, uh, doing math as like a five-year-old kid, you know, doing all kinds of math, measuring gravity. You know, he's actually the one that invented a plum device that helps measure the gravity of the, the Earth in different places. Um, he was also working for his father during uh, the Civil War. His, his father was the head of the National Geodetic Geodet Survey, if I'm remembering it right. Uh, and he worked uh, measuring and, and doing surveys. Um, and they were primarily mapping things for the North during the Civil War. Uh, so that was one of the other things he was doing. So he was working as a scientist, mathematician, a logician. Um, and for him, pragmatism was associated with a theory of semiotic, a theory of semiotic or meaning. Um, let's see if this. Uh, Lawrence Scientific School is mentioned quite a lot there. Um, United States Coast Survey, what did I call it? I called it the, sorry for the, oh, it is still called, oh, it's renamed that now. So, so that's what it is now, the Geodetic Survey. Um, he also traveled to Europe, so he's familiar with a lot of things going on in Europe. Um, and you have to understand, too, that uh, at the time, even though Harvard was a college and Yale was a college, by the way, Yale, in some, I think it was around 1860, uh, gave the, awarded the first PhD in the United States, first PhD degree. But for the most part, Americans that wanted a higher education went to Europe because there wasn't anything offered in the United States. Um, Remember, um, uh, the Virginians went to William and Mary, uh, but that was probably like more like a, a you know advanced high school at the time uh, than a, a school. None of them had graduate schools, uh, for example, um, until really uh, at James's time. In fact, uh, not only was James the first one to teach a psychology course per se. Although it wouldn't be the same as what we, we would think of as psychology today. Uh, but it was also the first time that they offered graduate courses at Harvard, graduate level. And that was partially because of the president of the college while James was, was teaching there, was a young man who wanted to change the college and move it away from the traditional kind of studying Greek and, uh, and, and uh, uh, Latin and the ancient texts and, that, and then you're you're done, <laughs> you know. No, he wanted it to be a more practical kind of school that gave people trades, you know, and prepared them for the kind of work uh, that America, the new country, needed, right? Um, and by the way, um, who was it? Uh, uh, I'll think of it in a, in a minute. Um, but uh, the Metaphysical Club, I want to mention that because uh, how they all knew one another was through their, uh, their working together in what was called the Metaphysical Club. And um, they actually had lots of clubs. They had, uh, when, when James visited London, for example, he attended a meeting of the Aristotelian Club and, you know, the, the Radical Club and the, you know, you know all these different clubs. Uh, which his brother Henry was a member of, so, so he got to visit them too. Uh, besides the Royal Society, so James also visited the Royal uh, Scientific Society. Um, 
but the metaphysical club was in Boston uh, and, and Harvard and was a club of, of those people who were interested, uh, all males, uh, but uh, notice uh, the Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes was one, uh, Charles Sanders Peirce was one, um, William James was one, and if you're interested in that kind of story, which I, I recommend, there's a book called uh, Metaphysical Club by Louis Menon. And there you have it. That's a great book to read if you have some time and you're interested. And it talks about um, John Dewey as well. Uh, John Dewey was the other uh, pragmatist that we'll, we'll talk about, but we'll talk about him next class. Uh, he was also uh, referring to his philosophy as instrumentalism instead of pragmatism. Well, he's still a pragmatist, but his, his what he called his philosophy was instrumentalism with the idea that knowledge was an instrument. So what is pragmatism? Um, So, oh, oh, by the way, this uh, paragraph, The American Outburst, if you could read it, um, let me enlarge it a little bit. That's a quote from the book, The Metaphysical Club, by Louis Menon, from the beginning. So Charles Peirce, William James, John Dewey, and George Herbert Mead, who was into sociology, uh, and I believe... George Herbert Mead was, uh, along with John Dewey, were both teaching at the University of Chicago, which is where uh, John Dewey did a lot of work. But we'll we'll talk about him Wednesday. Um, so the pra the word pragmatism, I s I've seen it. Um, for example, Kant's first book was a uh, anthropological, uh, a pragmatic anthropology, or something of that sort. Um, it was anthropology from. Thank you, thank you. Um, so what does pragma mean? That which has been done from Greek. And it's apparently uh, uh, similar to the concept of res, a thing, in Latin. Uh, and Kant gives us, it's a relation to some definite human purpose. Peirce will say it's how knowledge is related to human action. And Peirce uh, will say that the foundation is a behavioral semiotic. So a theory of meaning of signs, semiotic is the meaning of signs, and the signs are not only signs in our head. So, so in other words, if I see a table and I'm thinking the concept table, the concept table is a sign. The impression that I experience of the table is the impression that I'm getting the phenomena, right? But that I think, ah, oh, that's a table. And notice, by the way, it's different in French because it's la table, which is feminine. Which is so weird to me, right? Um, because everything in French is either masculine or feminine. There's no neuter. Uh, and, and it does, by the way, have an impact on the French mind they actually attribute feminine characteristics to feminine word, you know, the, you know, words that are feminine and masculine characteristics to masculine words, even though there apparently no real clear rhyme or reason to why one is, is one or one is the other. Same sort of thing in German. There's there's a lot of neuter words in German, um, but they do have a lot of words that are masculine or feminine, even though it's like a tree. <laughs> Why would a tree be masculine, or, or you know, or or a stein? You know what? You know what kind of characteristics does a, a bridge, burka, have that makes it masculine as opposed to feminine, or neuter? Uh, makes me be very puzzled. Um, but if you're thinking uh, that knowledge is related to human action and it's a behavioral semiotic. What you're trying to figure out is what's the relation between, between these signs that we make in our head that we're thinking cognitively about, right? Um, 
and the actual phenomena that experience. And so for what uh, James and, and uh, Charles Sanders Peirce and others are, are working on really is a, a theory of how language fits our, our practicality. You know, how, how, do we, how do we as human beings benefit from having language and from having consciousness uh, one of the things that uh, is going on that James is, is very involved with, more so than Charles Sanders Peirce. Peirce is more focused on